and you're, you're placing time of death at around noon. Let me just do a little math here for a second. Let's go, uh, let's go four hours. Four hours. Let's go four hours. And you're using time of death at Sorry. being roughly noon. There, there was a cough. The, the witness, we're changing from six to four. Objection, argument. Well, I, I, I didn't, just I didn't a moment. Understand. I didn't hear. I'm sorry. I understand. Yeah. There's some coughing, and people are entitled to cough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I need the, the question re-asked, please. Go ahead. The objection is sustained. The, you're assuming time of death at roughly noon? Yes, sir. Okay. And you're saying that uh, during at least four hours prior to that, Yes. Okay, so you're saying from a window of 8 o'clock a.m. till 12 noon? Yes. Okay. The findings of Pacific Toxicology, do they support uh, that Michael Jackson ingested orally tablets of lorazepam during that time period of 8 a.m. to noon? No, they disprove it. And in a previous hypotheticals to witnesses, Mr. Flanagan has asked witnesses to assume the ingestion occurred at 10 a.m. Uh, would this disprove uh, that Michael Jackson uh, ingested orally lorazepam tablets at 10 a.m. as uh, presented by Mr. Flanagan in earlier hypotheticals? Absolutely. And what if you go earlier than 8 a.m.? I would want an opportunity to, <laughs> that's why I brought my laptop, I'd want an opportunity to do a little bit of uh, mathematics to, to take the, dis the, I can, part of understanding the kinetics is to understand how tablets break apart and the t how long it takes for tablets to break apart. I could do that calculation in about five minutes, but I would actually have to do the exact calculation. Um, so uh, it's a cal it's, it is a calculable number, um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do the calculation to see what it what it is. Okay. But there's but there's no chance at 10 o'clock, and at at uh, but midnight the night before it's entirely possible. And would you characterize the amount in Michael Jackson's stomach? Uh, the 634 nan nanograms per milliliter or 0 0.047 milligrams, would you characterize that amount as trivial? Yes, it's trivial. <clears throat> now, I want to get into a different area, Dr. Schaefer, and that is uh, in the, your expertise in regard to simulating the responses to drugs. Yes. And have you indicated, as you indicated, I believe on your first day of testimony, uh, you have uh, significant expertise in simulating the responses to various drugs? Yes, I do. In fact, that's been part of your research and part of your academic career for at least the last 25 years? Yes. If a researcher or academic uh, seeks out an expert in this field to conduct this type of uh, modeling? Uh, isn't it true you would be one uh, of probably two people in the world that they would seek out? It, it, it's a small community, yes. And again, now we're getting into uh, the science of specifically pharmacokinetics as it relates to propofol. Correct. <laughs> May I have just one moment, Your Honor? Please. I realize you, you mentioned this before, but as we get into the pharmacokinetics, uh, can you again just kind of explain to us 
what it is before we get into the modeling as it relates to propofol. So again, pharma, drugs, kinetics, motion. In pharmacokinetics, we're looking at drugs in motion in the body, and specifically, how does a certain dose of drug give you a certain concentration? And as you saw in the lorazepam simulation, it's not just the concentration as one number, but the concentration over time, as the concentration rises and falls. That's what pharmacokinetics tells us. And then you, with that, you could predict, for example, how much propofol would be in the blood after a particular dose. Correct. And I think you'd mentioned this is one of the courses you teach at uh, UCSF? Correct, it's part of that. And then again, just to explain to us the difference then between pharma, pharma co-kinetics and pharma co-dynamics. All right, so again, pharma is drug. Dynamic, from Greek dynamikos, is power. And it's about the power of the drug, or in other words, how much effect does the drug have? How powerful is the drug in your body? Is pharmacodynamics. And it talks not about the concentration of drug, but the power, the effect of the drug in your body. And again, these are based on the mathematical models uh, that you work with in your research right. on a daily basis. Right. There's basic concepts, but to be useful, it has to be mathematical. Equations that you solve in order to figure out first the concentration and then the drug effect. And it has to come down to mathematics in order to have a, a number you can work with. And what does this slide show, Dr. Schaefer? So this shows the linkage between the two. You give a dose of a drug, and the pharmacokinetics is used to tell you what is the concentration. Now, I should mention that this, by dose, I mean all doses. You take all the doses and you put them in, and you just call that the dose. Maybe a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit, a little bit later. That's the dose. Whatever was given at any time is the dose. The concentration that you predict is not one number, but it's that curve over time. It's the concentration at every point in time following the dose because the concentration will rise and fall. And that whole curve is the, what the pharmacokinetics predicts. The pharmacodynamics then says for any given concentration, what's the drug effect? Concentration drives drug effect. It's, that's what the body sees. What is the concentration? And that's what the pharmacodynamics tells you is for any given concentration, what is the drug effect? Since the concentration is changing over time, the drug effect will change over time. So this right here is dose, but it's all the doses over time. This is concentration, but it's the whole time course of concentration. And this here is drug effect, will be the time course of drug effect. How does the drug affect the body over time? And that's, and that's called a kinetic, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic model. It has the two pieces linked together. And you did analysis on the far, uh, propofol concentrations in this case? Yes, I did. Okay. And in relying on publications, and I, I believe you'd mentioned these, uh, I believe it was yesterday, uh, but in your analysis in this case, did you rely on the two publications shown here on this slide? Correct. These are a publication about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics first author being uh, Dr. Thomas Schneider. And the principal investigator in each of those? Me. I'm sorry? I, I was the principal investigator. And, and it's just one study with two publications. And these were done, I, I think you'd indicated, at Stanford? This was done at Stanford, physically at the Palo Alto Veterans Administration Medical Center. Is it fair to say that these two studies uh, depicted on this slide, in which you were the principal investigator, are considered the definitive studies in this area? <laughs> These are the studies, in particular the first one, which are programmed into most infusion pumps worldwide that give propofol using pharmacokinetic models. So uh, it's available everywhere except the United States. 
the ability to use a computer to give propofol. And those computers are generally programmed. There's two models, but this seems to be the most popular, uh, the model by Dr. Schneider. And it's based on your data from these two papers? It's, it's, it's the model in these papers, yes. And is this the model you used uh, in the simulations regarding propofol in this case? Yes, it is. And, for example, when you did the modeling in this case, did it take into account Michael Jackson's then uh, weight, his age, and things of that nature? Yes. This, of, the, of the models that have been published for propofol, and there's a handful of them, this is the only model which includes the patient's weight and the patient's gender and the patient's age. No other model, at least, that comes to mind right now, no other model incorporates all three, weight, age, and gender. This model does, so it allows me to be a little bit more precise in matching the mathematics to Michael Jackson. And specifically in regard then to the second article, the influence of age on propofol pharmacodynamics, you relied on that paper as well? Yes, I did. Okay. And how did that model uh, serve in regard to you relying on it in this case? The drugs like propofol do not act in the blood. They act in the brain. And that's a very important distinction when you're talking about what's going on over the first 10 minutes after a dose of drug. Because were there to be an effect of the drug, either falling asleep or not breathing, it's the brain concentration, not the blood concentration, that's responsible for that. So we need some way of understanding what's going on in the brain. Now this was a volunteer study, and in a volunteer study, or in any study, I can't go you know, taking slices of people's brain to measure. So how do you know what's going on in the brain? The way you do it is you measure the drug effect very, very precisely. In this study, we use the electroencephalogram, brain waves. And we measure the brain waves very carefully, which allowed us to figure out, OK, if the blood concentration is kind of going up and down, I can see the lag. I can see the, the delay in what the brain does. And from that delay, I can figure out the brain concentration. This is a um, methodology that was developed by Don Stansky, who's my research mentor. And it's one of the reasons that I did my research with Don Stansky. It's a, it's a, it was a brilliant insight of his in about 1978. And it's this insight of how to understand the brain concentration without actually needing brain samples um, has been a revolutionary principle in pharmacology, not just in anesthesia, but throughout um, pharmacology for all specialties. And Don Stansky and Louis Shiner together came up with this insight. But that's what's being used here. We're using the EEG to give us a window on the brain. And with this, we can understand both the blood concentration and the brain concentration following any dose of propofol. And specific to propofol, uh, the, brain <coughs> excuse me, the brain concentration is referred to as the effect site? Correct. And what does that mean exactly? The effect site is the term that's more accurate because it, it's the site of drug effect. Now, since we're looking at the EEG as the drug effect, it's pretty obvious that that's the brain. What, what, is, what are you referring to when you say sorry. EEG? The EEG are brain waves, the electroencephalogram. The EEG is brain waves. And so we're looking at brain waves. That's the effect we're measuring. So the site of drug effect, the effect site, is the brain. But the key concept, the actual correct word, where I'm presenting this to a medical audience, is I would call it the effect site. But to try to make this as clear as I can, I'm going to call it the brain concentration. Um, because I think that makes it clearer. But the actual technical term that I would use in, in a medical setting is the effect site. And people would understand that the effect site was the brain. Now, in conducting the, um, well, not in conducting the modeling, but did you also rely uh, on this paper? Absolutely. Uh, and this is entitled Relationship Between Clinical Endpoints for Induction.